Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to our podcast by the New Books Network. I'm your host, Fulia Pinar. I'm here today with Eva von Redeke to talk about her book, Praxis and Revolution, a Theory of Social Transformation, published by the Columbia University Press in 2021, very, very recently. Thank you very much, Eva, for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Fulia. It's definitely my pleasure. It's an amazing (laughs) book. So at the New Books Network, we'd like to start with learning about our guests' backgrounds first. So could you tell us about your background, your biography? Sure, thank you. Um, So my background, my theoretical background is in critical theory. And I've always um, tried to bring in as much feminist, queer and gender theory into that as possible. And one knows the German Frankfurt School context, one knows that that's sometimes not so much possible. So it was a very exciting um, attempt to combine those those strands of thinking in the PhD. Yeah, and as for my actual, like my life background, I'm I'm from Germany. Most of my academic training was spent there. Um, I have spent some time in Cambridge and at the New School as well, though, and. Um, I've actually grown up very far away from the university on a little farm um, (laughs) doing stuff in the fields and with horses. And um, then, I don't know, have following that yearning to do theory through various German universities. So I started in Tübingen and later did my degree in Potsdam. And maybe one thing that is important for the book as well is that I was lucky to still be in the old German higher education system that has now been abolished where you could study for a very long time and three subjects simultaneously. So I did history, literature, and philosophy was my main subject, but I have that other training as well. And I I think um, it's reflected in the way that the book draws on literary examples, but also tries at least to keep track with this sort of state of the art of the historical research on the French Revolution, especially, and also a bit the AIDS activism of the 80s. So, so yeah, I don't know. That's that's the background that comes to my mind. I'm not. I'm sure. I, I there are omissions. Feel free to ask. <laughs> Yeah, so how you came to be interested in this particular topic of the book? I think one concrete inspiration was definitely discovering the work of Gustav Landauer, this kind of near forgotten Jewish German anarchist thinker from the um, sort of turn of the, well, the previous turn of the century, so 1900. Um, to 1920. Um, in fact, I was just in Munich yesterday because I gave a talk there and my host showed me the spot where um, the Kurt Eisner, the boss of or the, the kind of leader of the Munich Council Republic was shot and then soon after also Landauer was killed. So they were part of that very short um, attempt to establish a kind of very free libertarian socialism, like left libertarian, obviously. And I was just stunned when I found his work. And I, you know, I was very lucky that I was very kind of academically uneducated and naive at the time. And I had no idea about kind of what's a proper reference and what's not and how you have to like work through existing bodies of literature. So I really sat just there like a few years before finishing my degree and thought, wow, this is wonderful. He has so many great ideas. I want to like continue in that track or or bring them up. And then, um, yeah, then I kind of uh, crashed into reality and understood that there is such a thing as a state of the art. And, but that was good for me. And, but the, the idea, so the idea to then work on revolution specifically, I think has a parallel emergence from within critical theory because of course it has been a very important concept you could even say it's the kind of theoretical focal point of like theory if not from Hegel then from Marx and then sort of the early Frankfurt school a lot of the theory of ideology came from an attempt to understand why revolution didn't happen but the this idea of philosophy becoming praxis understanding praxis in a transformative way, but also understanding maybe why praxis was blocked. 
that's just what it means to be a critical theorist. And then <laughs> trying to work my way into this sort of certain state of the art to make this not into just an idea that I like, but into a proper PhD project, because that book is my, my PhD. I also realized that for quite a while, nobody had written about revolution, or if they did, then kind of farewell letters, you know, so it has many other discussions have taken more center stage in critical theory. And so that was then very exciting. And I was also very grateful to have the support of, of my supervisor, Rahel Yegi and then also Raymond Goes in holding tight and holding on to that concept, even though my intuition, partly fed by this early reading of Landauer, was always that it needs to be rethought in, a, in very new ways so that some people might think it's unrecognizable. So because I emphasize so much that radical change is very slow and processual people often say why do you even use that word revolution and that's i think where the political impetus comes in i think we have absolute necessity of sticking with a concept that has the maximum radius of transformation like given the mess we're in and the understanding we now have of the intersecting forms of oppression of kind of also the horizon of devastation of the natural world, but also the long kind of struggles against inequality and, and dehumanization. Like everything has to change. That doesn't mean that everything needs to be abolished, but everything needs to transform. So we can't just let the concept that we have for that sit and maybe be only taken up by some kind of militant megalomaniacs who give it a very very like retrograde masculinist civil war um, understanding so that's why i thought never mind the fact that the traditional philosophy of history and the, the idea of dialectics that once carried that concept has been criticized or mostly broken down. We need to excavate it and fill it with life again. And also, I mean, that we is, of course, a bizarre imagination. I mean, partly in a more humble tone, I would say it was also so obvious in the last years how many activists and real, really sort of serious political forces have tried so much to breathe life in it, but from starting from different um, premises or ideas of how revolution happens and, you know, theory can then at best catch up with it. Yeah. And um, let's now talk more about this topic. So in Praxis and Revolution, as you mentioned, um, this book is not a retrospective analysis on what revolutions looked like once Instead, you're redefining the entire concept of revolution in uh, by by looking at today's social world, today's social practices, and while doing so, you challenge a lot of the classic understandings of revolution. So, could you walk us through these conceptualizations of revolution that you challenge with this book, and um, tell us a bit more about how you conceptualize revolution? as opposed to these classical understandings? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I'll definitely do the latter. I think with the former, when you say I work th walk through or even work through contemporary social practice, then that's very generous of you because in some sense, that's of course the big gaping hole in that book that I'm not giving a detailed analysis of the present and of the situation we are in partly because I, well, still this thing, but definitely thought at the time of writing that, and that's, of course, a philosopher's concern always, um, I thought we don't even know which terms we should reconstruct that reality in. And that, of course, should never stop anyone from acting. But as a theorist, I felt we can't, I can't skip that. I need to really think about what terms to use to describe what the social that then is meant to transform is. So, and that's, um, and that's why the book spends half of its space actually talking more about um, social reproduction rather than social transformation and about very um, 
kind of uh, inert concepts of practice and of structure. Because I mean, if it wasn't wasn't inert, then it would be easy. Like then <laughs> you had the revolution in build. Um, and to maybe start, as you say, walking through that or saying what the gist of it is, I'm trying to avoid, I said that before, losing the concept of revolution. However, I think there is a way of losing it, which <laughs> comes from putting it too much on a pedestal, as in completely dissociating revolution from everyday life. And for instance, having a kind of totally uh, inflated notion of the event as something that that's kind of a force, whatever, a truth event in but you or like a kind of glorification of some sort of um, revolutionary violence in, in um, Zizek. And I think those... Um, I think those are abstract concepts of revolution that cannot account for their own conditions of success. And that's why I turn to precisely, in a way, the most um, over-discussed, one might even say boring, paradigmatic revolution as a French revolution. Because there you really think, well, if that's not the classical model of revolution, what is? And if that's not an event, then what was? And if it happened at the Bastille, that's how we look back at it. And I think I need to kind of test my idea of thinking revolution differently on that case. Because if that's possible to think about the French Revolution in this processual um, framework, then it, it definitely holds. And then something like the women's movement, where we would always have thought of it much more as an extended process, of course, that can then also fall into that template. But I want to build the concept on a kind of... Um, um, unfaithful reading of the French Revolution. So, what is the model? What's the what? What do I propose as an alternative? And one of the um, key ideas of the book is to um, think of radical change as interstitial change, so as a paradigm change over the course of which something that was once unthinkable, unintelligible gradually be turns into the new common ground. So with the French Revolution, for instance, we could say that the idea of human rights is such a thing. It's completely sort of unthinkable in a or feudal order of estates. And now we have, I think, partly um, in an unfortunate way, completely kind of tied all our imaginary of, of what politics is into that framework of subjective um, rights, just, just as one example. And then, of course, that sounds totally paradox, like how should something that is so unintelligible <laughs> then become the ne next big thing, you know, and especially if I don't want just one big bang in which that happens. And I think there is a notion which indeed um, can be found in Gustav Landauer's work, also many other um, feminist, queer and, and anarchist, and also um, especially recently, um, black radical writings that come from the um, tradition of marooning, that's the idea of interstitial revolution. So of revolution starting in those small little kind of almost invisible spaces of the social where practices get into friction or overlap or where innovation or something new can happen. And for this to become a force that shapes history, of course, many other factors have to be in place. And one way to summarize what the book does is to um, get out of that stupid alternative that either you have like local politics and an exaggerated fantasy that if only you are the revolution, then the revolution will work. And the other fantasy that is also wrong of saying nothing that we do matters. So those are both wrong, but just how interstitial or small scale micro practices can affect larger structures, that requires a lot of thinking and theorizing. And I think um, we can embrace this prefigurative drive or desire of a lot of activists or activist practice without having a naive idea of, you know, the, the local will win or 
or kind of a neoliberal idea of be the change you want to see. But just it's so it's become so standard to just reject that and be like, oh no, 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 the, the big picture has to change. But how does the big picture change? Because and I think that one other important criteria for revolutionaries is that we need to be able to imagine winning. So if the big picture changed, where is the new going to come from? And that's, I think, where the those interstices thought of in a much more modest register have a place. Because if you don't practice a new um, alternative, then it will never realize and never be stable, even if you kind of conquered power. But as we know, we also want to shape the um, change the shape of power. So how do you do that? And again, I think it's, it starts from those, um, yeah, those uh, interstices or from that emergent practice. So that that's maybe the the main idea. Yeah. Um, and now to understand how you apprehend praxis and revolution in your work yourself, let's start talking about some central concepts in the book. Uh, for example, in the title, uh, Praxis. So can you tell us a bit about the notion of praxis as you use it and how it gets to be related to what you call here the interstices and uh, metalepsis and um, how does this form of praxis um, relate to the structures? How are they connected to one another? Yeah, yeah, that's great because... Of course, there are definitions of practice in critical theory already in Marx and then especially in Sartre, where praxis already means kind of collective successful um, seizing of self-determination or the revolutionary moment. So then when you have praxis, you already have revolution. And in contrast to that, my notion of praxis or my, my, the kind of social theory I built through the book, starts with, in some sense, the, the most um, unrevolutionizable notion of practice, of an understanding of quite inert, repetitive patterns. Like, I mean, like is done in a lot of um, practice theory and, and social theory and in, so in science theory to some extent, where you really emphasize that in order to have agency at all, we always need to have a preceding kind of set of norms that inform that agency and that are partly explicit, partly embodied. And I mean, that's maybe for a podcast not too boring, right? But I try to kind of make a synthesis of um, several of the key um, practice theoretical approaches, combining some elements from Bourdieu and some from Wittgenstein to um, arrive of an idea of praxis that is not entirely structuralist. So it doesn't just say the practice is just the fate that will always just repeat itself, but also that doesn't have an overly sort of subversive optimism and just thinking that repetition will always bring about all those beautiful aberrations. And there's a lot of potential and, and fruitfulness in that as, as some delusion and then, and, and, also Judith Butler's approach have it. So I um, I differentiate three types of norms, the, the norms that are the, the embodied know-how norms, the norms that are the schema for practices that you need to um, know in order to even recognize something as constituting what it is. And when I say some things are unintelligible, then it means that their schemas aren't even shared or, or generally available. And then thirdly, there are more um, explicit evaluative norms. What, so for instance, more Aristotelian or Hegelian practice theories often talk about with which you can kind of um, judge whether the practice is done well or not. But in order to apply those, you always first need to even see what it is that you're doing. And then on uh, adding on to that, it's very important that this is not only embodied, but also always set in material environments so of practices. And I don't like those accounts that add the sort of symbolic or normative and the material side as if they're two different things. I think if you've done that, you've already lost the key point of practice theory. Because the key point of practice theory is that you don't think of something that is kind of frozen in time, 
like a statue where you could separate form and content. But if you think of practice, you think of something that is carried out through time. So it's unfolding. And so in some sense, it's always matter in motion. And the, the shape of that matter also informs how you even can recognize and judge it, but also the way it is treated that comes from the normative side co-constitutes the object. So I think that's a, actually a very old materialist insight and um, it's a more materialist reading of, um, for instance, Giddens and Butler than a lot of people do, but I don't think it's overstretching them. So it's I use practice partly to reject a kind of too linguistic or textual reading of the social. And with that account then you have a very fine-grained microscopic um, lens on the social. And I then, and I think that that's part of where my passion is for those concrete things. And I, it's also, I think, why I love the, to have those um, three novels or four artworks that I discuss throughout the book and draw from, from my examples because I feel one needs those fine-grained illustrations and you can't if you do social philosophy then either you have to really work with the proper historical cases or like you can't just make up some thought experiment that is then often self-fulfilling you need to have some very sort of detailed something that at least mimics the complexity of the social and the multi-perspectivity and I mean, good novels go, go a long way <laughs> to do that and can, I think, carry philosophy a bit further <laughs> than it can bring itself, maybe. Um, so from this kind of I, um, pointy list um, picture of the social, I then gradually move in this sort of second quarter of the book to have a more... Um, as it were, a more organized or more structured account of the social by saying that, of course, those practices don't all like stand next to each other, but they're, they're ordered in certain ways. They're uh, congealing into structures from being, from, from being repeated and becoming widely um, intelligible and widely um, articulated and practiced. So that's the kind of process of structuration that we also um, have in Giddens. And that you could say is a process of performative aggregation of practice, but also they're interlinked in many ways. So structures don't all stand as it were on the same level, even if they're all made ontologically from the same stuff, from social practice, still some structures become foundational in a way that I, I would call paradigmatic. Like some things, they've become so much the common ground of all other social practice. For instance, something like the, the two-gender order for at least 200 years has just become foundational for all sorts of social norms and um, codes of behavior and understandings of um, what other norms apply. And as I said earlier, human rights, the form of rights has become very foundational for, for politics. I've now been working for a long time on the um, role that property has as a paradigm of modern societies and that not only it organizes our disposal over goods, but also um, is a foundation for, for identity and the idea of self-ownership, again, for rights, um, for the legitimacy of the state. So certain practices have this function that I call anchoring and are kind of paradigms of the social. And then, of course, also you have um, power effects from practices linking into each other so that because a lot of things are the case, then another thing cannot happen. Like very basic things. I, I'm having, I'm discussing this, this example of um, the Mary Wollstonecraft um, novel where uh, the female main character um, unsuccessfully tries to escape her marriage and then everything's is stacked against her you know because the the legal system and the gender codes but also her kind of internalized bourgeois morality um the the way that you can or cannot book a coach if you're a woman traveling alone all those things make it inescapable for her and then there's the famous sentence where she says that's uh, mary wolfstonecraft puts it in those words marriage has bastilled me for life so she uses in this book that was written um 
10 years after the French Revolution, or seven, I think, she uses this um, uh, icon of the Bastille, but to talk about another um, social institution. And I, I love that formulation because I think a lot of my my inspiration for the book is trying to develop a theory of revolution that is not about storming the Bastille from without, but from within, like how to break out of the forms that, that are um, enshrining us. And, and for that, I think you need to understand those microscopic um, structures of practice and then, uh, yeah, structure. And um yeah, and once you've said all that, of course, it becomes very implausible how that should change because now I keep talking about <laughs> um, interlinking and repetition and all that, right? Um, yeah, and that's where then the second half of the book gets its puzzle from and um, builds on both uh, Judith Butler's account of, well, what I call performative critique or you could say resignification or parody and um, then later on... Um, Thomas Kuhn's notion of paradigm change and again a very Wittgensteinian practice theoretical reading of that. Yeah, um, that was a quite original creative pairing between uh, Kuhn's idea of paradigm shifts and Butler's idea of performative critique. So tell us more about how, um, like what, what these two share in terms of their orientations, their dynamics? How do they get to be related with your processual kind of conception of revolution? Yeah, you're right. I'm, to be honest, I was really surprised myself how well that worked. <laughs> um, so, I mean, let's see how many other people are convinced. But what for me is um, the, the common denominator that brings them together is a certain dynamic or a certain kind of almost, as it were, pattern or law of motion in how you get from the one regime or organization of the field to the other. And um, I, I, use, I <laughs> give it a, a um, tongue-twisting word, which is metalepsis. So that's a figure of motion, just as dialectics is a kind of figure of historical motion as well as an ancient figure from rhetorics. So, and if dialectics is the kind of confrontation of contradictions and then the, the solution arising from them, then um, metalepsis is a certain type of language game of two steps of transference so in, you have a riddle at the beginning which is constituted by a kind of allusion to something else that you only understand if you can solve yet another language game so it's a kind of double metonymy it's kind of you need two things you need to find the clue and then guess the riddle and that that to me was such a mm, rich and and promising figure to dissolve this um, dilemma that both Butler and Kuhn have, namely how to get from something that is allegedly unintelligible to the articulation of a whole new um, paradigm or a whole new like normative example. And that's that seems so um, that seems to to invite um, interpretations of a very abrupt and um, shift between two incommensurate regimes, as it were. So, and that's, of course, how many people have also interpreted Kuhn, so Richard Rorty, for instance. And I was so excited to discover more and more that that's a real, well, I mean, there can be many readings. I really think that's a misreading. So this whole idea of a shift between worldviews is not what Kuhn discusses, but he talks uh, he that he reserves that for somebody who's absolutely stubbornly refused to see that the field was in crisis and then is kind of confronted with this existential choice of either going into madness resistance or jumping into the new paradigm but that's a very kind of remote figure one that unfortunately i think we know quite well from social transformation as well but the actual change of a field in kuhn starts from a very slow process of erosion which is caused by anomalies anomalies so things that you cannot explain in the old paradigm or that 
kind of <laughs> don't make sense, but they keep occurring. And that to me seemed very um, uh, comparable to the idea that you have in Butler where there is a disruption of the normalized assumptions by, well, a parody or an aberration, or if she would always say something unintelligible that nevertheless somehow appears. There's something that doesn't fit the norm, and yet it somehow makes it way. Like, for instance, when she talks of gender parody, it's something that is kind of a contradiction in terms, and yet you you somehow are dis- it, it appears some. And then the other interesting um, thing, and that's where I would say Kuhn goes further, or you can do more with them, is that Kuhn thinks the new paradigm is not just a solution coming from elsewhere. The new paradigm often is prefigured, he writes, in the anomaly. So somehow the part of what it is that you have a field in crisis is that those anomalies mm, keep reoccurring. Just like, like just you would say with resignification, ever more people are sort of using this weird term, like say queer, or are bringing up something as absurd as a lesbian phallus or whatever Butler's examples of resignification would be. And with, with Kuhn as well, like that, everything kind of gets more and more pierced by those anomalies. And then the field decides that in a way, fixing those should be, is the next task. But mostly what happens is that instead of fixing those, you take something from them that suddenly allows you to make more sense of the whole field. So just like, for instance, from a kind of performative understanding of gender, suddenly of that Butler sees in sort of the 25 years ago that she wrote the book in drag. Now we then that rearranges the whole field in a way that now we have can speak, for instance, of self identification, like in a way that would have been impossible 30 years ago. And so we we've kind of taken from this anomaly the new paradigm of seeing the whole field. Um, and I've to. To draw that out of Kuhn, I found it very useful to, to work with Margaret Masterman, who's a quite forgotten and very <laughs> um, special figure in philosophy. She was a student of Wittgenstein. You know, Wittgenstein was so misogynist that he actually had no female students, but he had Elizabeth Einscombe, who he always referred to as old man. God knows why. But and then Margaret Masterman, and of course he used surnames, so then she also kind of sounded masculine masterman. <laughs> I think that was the condition under which those two kind of passed in those um male only Wittgenstein um seminars anyway. And she moved on to become a more um um applied uh, philosopher of language and linguist and was one of the first people doing computer science. And that's why she's kind of a bit forgotten in the history of philosophy. While, for instance, in Cambridge, where she worked, she's seen as the founder of computational linguistics. And um, Anyway, she wrote a very important critique of Kuhn, where she brings out a very Wittgenstein-inspired practice theoretical reading of what a paradigm is and how a new paradigm comes into being by a kind of recursive testing out of, she says, a new trick or like a, the kind of clue you took from the anomaly and then keep repeating until it starts sort of carrying more social weight and sort of slowly sediments and sinks into perhaps being a new anchor. Mm. So yeah, that's that's this this logic or this dynamism that, that I call metaleptic, that maybe is the second key term next to the interstitial. And it has conditions. It's not that that's always possible. You can't just plan to do it. You need to have a conjuncture of uh, certain structures that allow for such a transfer that you can sort of hijack them and then re-articulate them and start grounding them in a new paradigm. But it seems to me a good description of what happens in radical change and then the, at the end of the book, I also tested against the French Revolution scholarship, where even the kind of invention of the term the people or also the idea to have rights against the king was often 
kind of smuggled in first by mistake and then later adopted because it, it started carrying carrying some meaning that nobody could have imagined before. And yeah, very very interesting. So um, in the book, you also demonstrate that revolutions need to be anchored, as you mentioned, in social practices preceding the revolution. And these practices must be having a sort of long-term lasting impact on revolution by establishing this heritage, this revolutionary heritage. So the desired social change should already be sort of embedded in everyday practices and should not be postponed for after the revolution. So I found this a very interesting um, way of looking at it. And um, can we talk about the temporalities, the multiplicity of temporalities that this proposition entails? Yeah, great. Um, Definitely. It makes a real mess of temporality, right? Because it... it, um, twists around the the before and after and that's also one thing that you again use the this word metalepsis for as a rhetorical figure that you somehow say that what the new that we wait for in revolution is actually something that was there before and then you think well then it's not new but it's new as the paradigm and it was there before as the unintelligible as it were and this um this temporality that has this mix of impatience f- for from within the interstitial practices for the kind of breakthrough, but also of tremendous endurance. I mean, a lot of things, I think one thing that we really, if you look at the history of social struggles and resist the completely like misguided pr- history of progress up to now and now we are ready type of history of the winners then i am just always again stunned how contemporary previous generations of activists or previous struggles are in some of their moments and even though then that's always depressing because one is like okay great we haven't come much further like even there were attempts at having a radically different gender order and more based democracy than we now have in the French commune. And like, then it got all lost again. And then I just mentioned the the Munich council Republic and then it got lost again and so on. But also it, it shows, I don't think it's just lost because I think being able to draw on the past and be inspired by it and carry it further and also by and that's a very benjaminian thought by staging your your own hoped for prefigurative practice allowing forming a certain lens or throwing a certain light of the past as we have never seen it before that's a very um, hopeful or, or creative process. And I think every generation of, of activists does that again, that something becomes sort of citable, as Benjamin would say, from the past, that before you would have discarded or not counted into the heritage of revolution. It's, of course, something that the feminist movement has massively practiced, but also others. And in... The other half, so I said before that I use the French Revolution because it's such a standard textbook example. Well, I also use it because I really want us to learn to see it in a very different light. And that's why I, um, when I refer to the French Revolution, I end up in very unexpected places. Like, for instance, this um, liaison, ménage à trois, in the lunatic asylum where the the three characters try to break out. So that's a very different place than you usually find the main actors of the French Revolution. Or in this circle of Jacobin tricoteuses, those women who were taking their needlework to the street and were knitting. And then the the last... and, And those are real figures that there's also historical references for them. And then the third example is more... Um more fictional um, about this, uh, the two women 
petitioning the executioner to display a certain type of mercy towards their previous mistress. And I'm trying to read that not as a surrender to the ancient ancien regime, but actually as really establishing the victory of the revolution because they, they can allow to be merciful to their enemies. And that's, of course, a bigger revolutionary um, victory or gain than if you have to keep exterminating. <laughs> like That just means you're still afraid for your new order, and that means there are some people who are not free in it. So finding the, the revolutionary potential in those um, practices and not, you know, and not just looking for something that is odd, but then, and that I try to at least point to how it would look like with proper historiographical scholarship. So showing how all those things were constitutive for that change to take place. So it's not just something that happened at the side and now we can also look at what those women did. But if you like properly reconstruct as some of the great historians of the French Revolution, like for instance, Lynn Hunt, do the course of the events, then you see that it's made up of all those moments. It's made up of women conspiring on the streets over their needlework. Like that's what the revolution is. And so while I think in some sense there is a canon of mm, revolutionary struggle of a kind of effort to counter domination that you need to draw from in order to justify your agency as revolutionary and not just as any type of change. Um, you buy that very active reference. You can also modify and uh, enlarge that very tradition. This sort of recursiveness also feeds back into the what Benjamin again would call the tradition of the oppressed. No, and I'm just trying to, to give a tiny glimpse or model of that, you know, or, or, or find some terms that allow one to maybe grasp and nail down that thing that a lot of people I think are anyway doing when they're fighting or when they're seeking hope also in writings of the past or inspiration. Yeah, and, and your discussion on the canon brings me to my other question. So this is a theory of social transformation, but this is written in such an unorthodox way, so to say. So I want to share that I really enjoyed reading Practice and Revolution. The theoretical discussions you present here are so well written, so rich, so intriguing. I'm sure they will inspire so many people from various disciplines, different backgrounds. And one thing that I really, really enjoyed as an anthropologist was the examples you have used to illustrate your theoretical claims, which was pretty different than what I'm used to in terms of a theoretical kind of a reading. These examples you provide at a narrative level that's just so clear and fun, um, such as the examples about the queer activist group ACT UP and powerful mottos like everyone is essential from the Black Lives Matter movement. You show the importance of these anti-heroic um, future orientation, uh, future oriented kind of um, repetition and maintenance labor in the first half of the book, then move on discussing uh, possibilities of structural transformation through these um, social practices in the second half. And while you do so, you seem to be inspired by various scholars from the Black radical tradition, as you mentioned, the anarchists, feminists, but you also build your book over literary examples uh, from like Wollstonecraft, Dickens and Denison, as well as a video installation. So can you tell us a bit about how these come together in a theoretical book? What is theory here? Like, how do you approach to the theory, the critical theory itself? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I have this friend who's a joiner and he sometimes wants me to explain to him what I'm doing when I'm writing a book like and compare it to what he's doing when he's building a roof, you know, and putting all those beams in place and everything. Like, how does it come together? It's like, we, so how do I, I really think of it a bit in that way. How, how can you make it hold and carry weight, even though it seems many 
separate pieces that were lying apart a minute ago. Mm. So you're, I mean, I'm so glad you say that uh, it was enjoyable to read. That's wonderful because the literary examples were also partly there for me to make the writing enjoyable. I mean, as everyone who's done a dissertation knows, like, you know, working five years on this really tough stuff and you, <laughs> you need to feed yourself through it. <laughs> and um, that was, um, that was part of the trick. And I hope it kept, spills over to the experience of reading. However, Mm, there is a there is also a, a more as it were systematic reason for this material and it's interesting because one of the readers who then um commented on the on the german book and suggested also recommended that it should be translated for colombia they also um prompted me to highlight more that there is a as it were a force or an a, an agency of the literary examples because so far if i said like oh they illustrate the point but actually i i use them and i mean i'm actually embarrassed to say that but it's not entirely unlike um, the the phenomenology of spirit with with hegel unfolds i use the next literary example to show that what I that the terminology I developed to solve the problems or describe the example of the previous one hits an impasse or doesn't it's not enough it doesn't work anymore so you and it kind of gets shattered what I've built so far or disrupted by something that it cannot yet integrate and then the then sort of you pick up your pieces and the, the building goes of um or the sharpening of of um concepts and tools goes on to to accommodate this and i would say it's not a contradiction it's not dialectical i would say to accommodate this aberration or this anomaly or to also let yourself be inspired by it and this is actually repeated Afterwards, I like now retroactively, I also don't quite understand how on earth I managed to make this happen. But it, it happens to be <laughs> the case um, that the the um, constellation of the four examples that sort of carry each of the four quarters of the book, in a way, re stages or repeats this whole point about interstices, disruption, and metalepsis, because there are three examples that all take place in the French Revolution. And as we said before, then it's a kind of a bit of an unorthodox way to find the French Revolution. But there is an outlier in that row or in that set, which is the the third chapter, the, the chapter that also um, spends most time discussing Judith Butler's work, that actually is situated in the 19... Um, 80s and inspired by a video installation by Brian Landry and Matt Ebert um, about an act up protest. Um, it's actually uncannily present now that we're again in a, well, pandemic and also that the practice that I'm discussing a lot there, the die-ins, have now circulated again, through the Black Lives Matter movement and also the um, environmental movement, so Extinction Rebellion stages a lot of die-ins, so it's become um, weirdly contemporary. But this chapter has, in a way, the function to disturb the order or the, the taken-for-granted assumptions about the three others that are in this kind of classical place of the French Revolution and brings in some ideas of subversion of this anti-heroic agency, the kind of protester that is portrayed in that film seems in many ways very inept. And yet I try to bring out that the way in which her practice seems to be failing is exactly the way that that sort of creates a hinge from sort of one regime to the other and so in a way you need this kind of anti-heroic diva um, drag queen in order to then from within her practice look back into the French Revolution and find those other dimensions in it and also sort of for instance properly acknowledge 
the role of gender and sexuality in in those contexts already where our standard historical narrative maybe wouldn't um, locate them and yet if you if you um, zoom in then also in the dynamics of the French Revolution it was a crucial factor how gender and also sexuality sexual panics drove the events um, so yeah so I th I think I use them those examples to show something and also because you know I think sometimes of course we are trained as philosophers to really convince our readers and to really show that we're right and to really build an argument that goes step by step and is kind of seamless and of course I mean I'm doing that work there otherwise it wouldn't have like uh, succeeded as a PhD and I mean yeah believe me it was tough with the supervisors I had so but I hate if one carries that to the point where I feel you're kind of absolving your reader or you're, you're just kind of taking over the space for their thinking sometimes I don't want I just want to show something and then either people see it and then they can sort of draw out their own conclusions I mean everybody can think right so I feel that a book that is compelling needs to have some elements that kind of don't just force the reader to see that they're right but in some sort of sequence but also invite like Exceed, create an excess of the the text as it stands in its ex, like spelled out argument and, and invites further reflection. Maybe also undermines, um, yeah, the, the the writing itself. And so I guess that's the that's the encounter here. <laughs> oh, that, that's amazing. So well, Eva, I could go on and on about this amazing book that I really, really enjoyed reading so much, but we have already taken a lot of your time. So let's talk about the projects that you're currently working on or you're planning to work on. Yes, actually, the I think there is a way in which what I'm doing now, even though it seems very scattered and all over the place, really follows from that book. Because as I said at the beginning, I even though I build a kind of social theory and a formal account of transformation in, in there, there is no analysis of the present moment, like not whatsoever. I don't say what capitalism is and therefore also don't say how we overcome it. And now, and of now I, I was very and sort of ambitious <laughs> afterwards to show that the theoretical framework that I suggest there um, can be filled and can be, um, but I think that is a kind of, that that's the next step. And so now I've written a book that um, sort of gives an account or analysis of capitalism starting or anchored in um, the form of the modern form of property, which I take to be crucial, not just in a kind of standard, like every leftist knows that the distribution of goods is of course entirely crucial, but also the form of property, what kind of practice it is to own something, what kind of norms guide the subject object relation there. Um, that that's a kind of hinge in modernization and as we know it, so colonization, enslavement, also patriarchal appropriation of reproductive labor are mediated through the modern form of property, which um, as we only know from very recent research in the history of ideas is not, as Marx and Proudhon wrongly believed, just a rapid recapitulation of the Roman law form of property, but really its own genuine form. This idea that ownership means total disposal over a good, including the right to destroy and abuse it, and including the right to discard and abandon it, which are all functionally necessary for a capitalist economy because you need to really be able to extract the resources and also you need to be able to alienate all the goods without sort of worry or responsibility because otherwise you can't have a market flow. But this, I think, we can trace through fossil um, capitalism and the whole kind of extractivist waste production to the present moment where we're really like <laughs> encountering a moment where social movements folk have to start focus on the question of life, like survival of precarious of lives as in Black Lives Matter or the mod mobilization against femicides and also whole species. So as in the like environmental 
um, movements and climate justice movements, whole areas of the globe where life is at stake. And so I try to show how this kind of property inspired abuse of control of sort of little cut out pieces of life and also the um, toxic disruption of regeneration of life cycles by the things that have been discarded. So first of all, of course, the carbon dioxide in the the kind of fossil run economy, but then also many waste products in the process of um, production, how that has kind of brought us to this point of, of, yeah, utter devastation or destruction of life. And also how there is a sort of common, and I would say common anti-capitalist core in many strands of, of social mobilization that clusters around life as well. And that sort of, instead of having a, I think, a very tired opposition between so-called identity politics and so-called social question, I think one should actually look at what the current movements are doing and something much richer, something much more kind of future-oriented, reparation and reproduction-oriented, and it's centered around the question of life, livability, and sort of regeneration. And I would say the liberation from various forms of dominion or um, property-like um, violence that's the so that's the that's in some sense that and then if people ask me where are the interstices then now I would say well look into those movement practices for as for starters like that's one place where to look and this is yeah this is actually also out already but I feel I have to yeah I wrote it very fast and it's written in a public audience oriented <laughs> kind of more style of philosophy that I had tremendous joy in doing. I mean, I also partly did it because I needed money, <laughs> but but, um, but it was, a, I think, this attempt to write something readable or that desire even um, that has, has done me very good to expand that through my work. And I'm now making the experience that actually also the academic readers like this book even though it wasn't written so much for them but i'm afraid it's not i mean it's been translated in many languages um i think we're counting six now but it's not yet english but i hope that we even have so shouting out trans full translation funding <laughs> so whoever <laughs> yeah, i think it will come out eventually yeah and right now i'm writing some papers about more closely how in some sense, the counter-revolution to, for, to this revolution for life functions in a kind of regressive recurse to what I call phantom possession. So sort of defending like imagined spheres of rightful entitlement. And um, we, I think we see that in yeah a lot of the authoritarian movements around the globe and we need a different model of understanding them from the kind of very interesting one from the 30s from the frankfurt school because it does that doesn't capture the intersectional multiplicity and and i also see that so many of my good lefty friends that they're always again surprised that this complete idiotic bullshit strategies like the memes about whatever gender studies conspirations that then that they actually work and that Bolsonaro, for instance, partly came into power on those memes. And I think we need a better, like, we we can't be, we have to stop being surprised by that. And we have to understand how this is actually also linked to the political economy, because sort of phantasmatic masculine entitlement in the gender order is a kind of compensation for in a economy where all sort of material security is so precarious and also kind of real property titles are liquefied and financialization and digitalization and so there is are those regressive kind of ideological objects of property that become more and more politicized and structuring the debate and so yeah that's the the theory of the possessive individual that i think should be called the dispossessive individual wow these all sound so amazing and so interesting. We'll certainly be looking forward to being familiarized to your next projects <laughs> you. more. 
Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Eva von Redeke, for your time, for joining us, for this amazing book and for answering uh, all these questions. Thank you, Fulia. It's amazing to be given all that space to talk about it. Thank you so much. The pleasure is certainly mine. Um, I'm your host, Fulia Punar. This discussion of Praxis and Revolution, a theory of social transformation, published by the Columbia University Press, is brought to you by the New Books Network. Thank you for listening. <laughs>